Um, but quick reminder of what GOMI is. Uh, so our mission as an organization is to create an educational platform where interested students as well as healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness as well as emergency medicine. We work super hard to showcase diverse spheres in which physicians as well as other healthcare professionals make an impact and truly inspires others to think of abstract ways to use um, our careers in healthcare and as well as medicine. And we work hard to create an international community of wilderness medicine enthusiasts, as well as experts, and are committed to promoting diverse and culturally competent environment. And since we work super hard on all this, if there's ever a speaker you'd like to see or a topic you'd like to see, um, just go ahead and reach out to us. We love hearing from our audience and we love bringing new topics as well as speakers to you guys. Just a reminder, if you haven't already, go ahead and join our mailing list. You can scan that QR code right there. Um, we do bi-weekly lectures. We also featured various wilderness opportunities. We have an annual fellowship showcase featuring different types of fellowships, um, as well as a certificate course. And we're working on getting some free stuff to you guys as well. And we also have social media. Go ahead and follow us on Instagram. That's a really great way to find out what our speakers will be, as well as our schedule for the semester. You can also visit our website for similar information, as well as other wilderness medicine resources for students. This semester, we're super excited to have a gear giveaway. Um, we'll be giving away some swag, some Pit Viper swag specifically. So since you're here attending the talk, we're going to drop a link in the chat and go ahead and um, fill out that form and then you'll get entered to, to uh, be involved in the drawing. We're going to draw a couple names at the end of the semester and we'll let you know if you won. And here's a quick view of our schedule. You can also view this on our Instagram as well as on our website to get a more in-depth look. This week we have toxins and poisons in mountain medicine and next week you can look forward to compassionate care in the wilderness on November 2nd. So this week we have Captain J. Pierce Beisinger. Um, Pierce is a California native who grew up on the East Coast. With previous experience in orthopedics, he has spent the last decade serving as a physician assistant in cardiothoracic surgery and emergency medicine. Going vertical has been a lifelong pursuit for Pierce. Pierce is a fellow in the Academy of Wilderness Medicine and an AMGA certified single pitch instructor. After having completed his diploma in mountain medicine, he has continued to provide locums instruction at the University of New Mexico International Mountain Medicine Center. He has served on the board of directors for the Appalachian Center for Wilderness Medicine and has dedicated many years of service to search and rescue teams across the country. He is currently the assistant medical director of Portland Mountain Rescue and chair of the Rescue Systems Committee. Alongside multiple wilderness medicine publications and his work with the outstanding members of PMR, Pierce serves as the Oregon Air Na serves in the Oregon Air National Guard, uh, the 142nd Fighter Wing SERP unit. Pierce is the recipient of the 2017 Warren D. Bowman Award for contributions and service to wilderness medicine and the Wilderness Medicine Society, the 2018 PA Citizen of the Year Award and the Oregon Medical Association, and the 2019 Founders Award. Uh, from the Appalachian Center for Wilderness Medicine. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Pierce, so much for being here. And without further ado, I'll turn this over to you. Awesome. <clears throat> That's, uh, that was quite the introduction. And what a great organization uh, you guys are putting together. This is fantastic. And I think it'll go on to serve a lot of people. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share screen and get us started here. I see a couple of people from Portland Mountain Rescue have joined us uh, in the audience as well this evening. Nice to see those of you who are here. And um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, tonight's talk, uh, yes, we will be talking about uh, toxins and poisons in mountain medicine. Uh, those things come in all shapes and form. And so uh, my, my uh, sort of my mantra for the evening is don't get bit, don't rub it on you, and whatever you do, don't breathe. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes? Fantastic. I may, let me just uh, do one thing real quick. I'm going to minimize this, hide that over there. Go back to play mode, uh, much better. Okay. So um, yes, uh, as she mentioned, uh, I work with Portland Mountain Rescue, which is uh, primarily serving the Mount Hood, uh, metropolitan Portland, Oregon area. I also serve in the Oregon Air National Guard with the 142nd Medical Group, 
uh, in what's called the SURF P unit, and that's a chemical, biological, radiation, environmental disaster response team. Uh, our main focus area is uh, getting ready and prepped for the Cascade Subduction Zone earthquake, but we do a lot of other really cool things too. Uh, and so with that, I uh, get a lot of exposure to uh, toxins and poisons and, and things that can hurt you in the wilderness. Um, Katrina, I see some people who need to be admitted to the waiting room if you could handle that part. Great. All right. So uh, what do we hope to learn from tonight's lecture? Well, mostly I, I'd like to just increase our awareness of wilderness medicine in the Pacific Northwest. We're uh, going to look at uh, identifying some hazards, uh, how to prevent their uh, impact on us. And, and when they do impact us, uh, what is our, our treatment? Uh, our geographic relevance will be here in the Pacific Northwest, but some of the things that we talk about won't be just ubiquitous to here. They'll also be things that are more prevalent across the United States. And my goal uh, is that the impact of this conversation will provoke conversation amongst yourselves uh, and uh, increase your uh, desire to learn more about wilderness medicine and perhaps find ways to fit it into your career. Um, I have been a PA since 2001. I, I do work in cardiac surgery and critical care is my main gig. I, I do some uh, moonlighting in the ER uh, and uh, have found lots of ways to incorporate wilderness medicine into my career. Not any of those really uh, earn any money, but uh, that's, another, that's another lecture about that topic. Um, as far as disclosures of commercial interest or profit gaining measures, I, I don't really have any. Yes, I've written some books. I own some small companies. None of them really make any money, uh, but so I, I won't claim any uh, conflict of interest for this evening. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Toxins and poisons in mountain medicine. Don't get bit, don't rub it on you, and don't breathe. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to jump in onto the, the don't rub it on me uh, discussion. And we're gonna look at the toxicodendrons, uh, poison oak and poison ivy. And somebody's like, oh, come on. Poison ivy, I've heard about that. Um, but uh, I think it's important to talk about this type of uh, insult uh, to, our, to our, our dermal system, mostly because it's so prevalent. And I can't see you right now because I'm looking at slide mode. So I want to ask you to raise your hand. But if somebody wants to unmute themselves, I have a question for the group. And, and what is the most common wilderness medicine injury? If you had to just say like all the national forests, national parks, rural areas, what's the most commonly reported wilderness medicine injury? Somebody speak out. Go ahead. We have someone in the chat saying burn. Burn. That that is that is high on the list for sure. It's uh it's actually lower extremity injuries. There was a study uh done over in the Shenandoah National Park. Uh this is actually specific to national parks and national forests. And it was lower extremity injuries, fracture sprains uh that that hit the top list. Now that was from 2011. Things may have changed since then, but definitely burns would be on, on the high in that group. And, and so would dermal injury. So I, I really like burn there. I see some more things populating in the chat. We'll also talk a little bit about stinging nettle. And even though this is a don't rub it on me uh, topic, we, we'll, we'll highlight uh, nightshades and death cap mushrooms. Uh, before we go too much further, I, I, I do want to say that we're going to be covering a lot of topics tonight. And uh, wilderness medicine is a very broad area, uh, from desert to submarine to outer space to Pacific Northwest uh, context. And I like to uh, describe uh, this type of lecture as I'm inviting you into my kitchen. I'm, I'm showing you the menu of all the things that we could encounter. But when you leave, you're going to go out the door with just a little after dinner mint, a little taste uh, of of each of each topic and uh, hopefully uh, that has you thirsty and hungry to come back for more. So with that, let's keep going here. Uh, poison oak and Western poison ivy. Another one that I, I don't have in the list here is poison sumac, but that's primarily because it's located on, on the East Coast. And so we won't talk too much about that one. Uh, these are both in the toxic gadentrin group. And I, I, I have a bunch of different pictures here mostly because uh, as is prevalent throughout the entire lecture this evening, you'll notice that there is some variations in, in the presentation of whether it's an animal or a plant uh, that should you know, uh, raise our eyebrows and make us question you know, what really is this. So on, on the right-hand sided pictures, you'll see the leaves tend to be more glossy, more bright green. There, there are more fresh spring growth of poison oak in the top and poison ivy in the bottom. And as fall comes about, you see that that glossiness has gone away. The red leaves have 
come out in the fall. And certainly they stick out like a sore thumb when you're walking past them from their bright colors. When we talk about poison oak, uh, in general, we talk about the whole leaves of three, let them be, but that's not exactly completely true for uh, poison oak. There can actually be five leaves. They tend to have lobed edges. Uh, if you look at the little cartoon in the bottom, the poison oak is on the left with the, the lobed edges. And uh, by literature account, they can grow up to eight feet tall, but by and large, we see them in the three to four foot range. And like I mentioned early, or earlier, the, the colors do change this season. And like poison ivy below, the, the, the resin or the oil that we're concerned about is urushiol, which is what is the uh, the impact, what impacts our, our dermal system and causes the contact dermatitis. Uh, toxicodendron ridbergri, that's the Western poison ivy. Uh, typically, when you look at it in a cartoon, you see it in this sort of three-leafed, uh, pointy uh, type configuration, but it's not uncommon to see it to be a little bit more jagged than the cartoons would have you believe. And, and even as the leaves get beat up over the season or wilting and things like that occur, uh, those leaves can actually look a little lobed uh, not I mean, obviously different than poison oak, but they're not as uh, perfect as you might uh, picture from the cartoons. And again, the leaves change there. So uh, we talk about this like low extremity injuries, uh, burns and dermal injuries. Sorry about the dog barking. Uh, contact dermatitis is our, uh, our, our thing we're worried about. It accounts for about 7.1 million outpatient visits per year. Now that's all contact dermatitis. Uh, but uh, certainly a, an important uh, component to that is, is what we're exposed to in the back country. Interestingly, I don't know if you have had poison ivy or poison oak exposure in your life. It's not something that we uh, often will respond to the first time that we have seen that exposure and that, that sensitiz sensitization occurs later on in life. And uh, somewhere in our teen years is what it's thought to be. Um, roughly 50 to 75% of the US population is sensitive to the urushiol resin. And I can remember the first time that uh, I actually became uh, sensitive to, to it myself. I, I grew up playing in the Appalachian region of East, Eastern uh, United States and running through the woods with, you know, barely, a sh you know, barely shorts on, definitely no shirt, it's so humid there, and never really having a problem with poison oak or poison ivy. And then I was in Connecticut uh, in New Haven uh, going to school. And I I remember bushwhacking through a forest off a mountain one time and I was riddled with it. And there was not really a good explanation as to why, why that occurred, except that I had developed that sensitization over the time of my life. But its impact on the general population is pretty profound. It, it encompasses 1% of the total California workers' compensation budget. I thought that was a pretty impressive statistic, just from poison ivy and poison oak uh, and the contact dermatitis. In Oregon, uh, it, if you look at our forestry service, 33% uh, of California, Oregon, and Washington forestry service workers are affected each year. A lot of that has to do with our firefighting uh, workers, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So let's look at the the agent that is is the enemy here. It's it's urushiol, and by and large, it's colorless, maybe a slight yellow tinge. But when it's oxidized, it does become black. It doesn't have a smell. Uh, in general, you don't really see it. And um, the 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 bad booger of, of of this this guy is that even after uh, it's you know you've been have had it on your clothing or your climbing rope or, or your backpack in its dried state, left by itself. It could stay there for an indefinite amount of time that, that you would pick up that same climbing rope, say, two or three months later and get the resin on you and then have a, another reaction to the to the poison ivy. So it is found anywhere on the plants, uh, the stem, leaves, roots, the skins, uh, particularly when you break them or step on them or, or snap them as you go past them, uh, you're going to be exposing yourself to that. Uh, as it... Uh, begins to impact the skin. It's, I mean, we could talk about the, the lymphocyte driven T cell mediated response, but essentially there's a cytotoxicity that leads to vesiculations, little little papules that uh, begin to occur, swelling and edema and, and then erythema. The, the, the bottom right picture is about the worst case I've ever seen uh, as far as uh, documented photos of, of poison ivy. That, that, that poor uh, soul has, has it pretty bad. Um, when we have sort of smaller exposures and less uh, severe reactions to it, uh, you you may notice that it occurs in this linear formation on on the skin, uh, much in the way that you brushed up against something and it's it it affects just that area of contact uh, in a linear like fashion. 
And it may not occur uh, quickly. It may happen, you know, even a week or two later after the exposure. So I mentioned uh, people in the fire service. Uh, this is a picture of a fellow down in California in uh, Tehachapi. Uh, he was a wildland firefighter that I was given a conference uh, down there, and he shared this picture with me. Um, this uh, guy, when he was sweating into his pants uh, during the firefighting work, uh, that sweat made the pants uh, wet, and the, the Urashawa resin is able to just wick down to the skin through the wet clothing. And, and as we talk about prevention and treatment, uh, that, that that particular uh, element is something that we'll talk about. But you can see where his boots, uh, where they stopped and started, that, that there was really no penetration uh, there uh, to speak of. But certainly the edema in his le uh, legs, you can see. So what happens when you get it? Uh, you want to get it off of you, obviously. And, and so, you know, don't rub it on me. Um, the, the best thing you could do is to, to quickly, as, as fast as possible, get those clothes off, uh, rinse uh, with water. Uh, it, it, it used to be rinsed with soap and water, but it's thought that the uh, soap can um, emulsify the oil and help spread it uh, on the tissue. So uh, that's no longer in, in the recommendations. And, and Wilderness Medical Society has some uh, practice guidelines on, on this topic, and um, you can... Uh, do some more intense reading there. But you should know that uh, the oil is very quick to get absorbed. And so even if you're washing uh, with water, jumping in a creek or whatever, uh, within 10 minutes of your exposure, you're only getting off about 50% of the your shile uh, resin from, from being absorbed. And, and that really drops down to 10% within 30 minutes. So if you think about a, a, a patient or yourself in the back country, and you're on a two hour hike and you're, you're encountering, you know, poison oak or poison ivy, uh, and you've got another hour back to the car, uh, unless you've got spare clothing, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a real challenge to keep that from being absorbed by you. So uh, I mentioned that I have no conflicts of interest, and I'm, I'm certainly not endorsing uh, anything in the treatment of contact dermatitis related to poison ivy and poison oak, but I think it is good to review with you some of the things that work and don't work. And, and these are uh, low-powered studies by and large, but uh, these are off-the-shelf remedies that you may have seen or heard of, and um, from the literature, what's known about them, I can confirm to you that Technu and Xanfel and even Goop uh, work fairly well to improve the, the, the dermatitis symptoms, the erythema, the vesicles, the, the edema, um, over uh, placebo or doing nothing. Uh, interestingly, dial dishwasher soap, <clears throat> dial, not the hand soap, but the dishwasher soap, uh, as well as diluted gasoline all showed improvements uh, in those symptoms. Now, if you're just treating the itchiness, the pruritus, uh, calamine, cold compresses, uh, oatmeal and baking soda baths work well. Uh, what not to do, and I learned this the hard way, and so I'll share that here, uh, is putting any sort of like uh, mupiracin or bacitracin, anything like that on the skin or any of your uh, topical Benadryls uh, are not helpful and they can actually make uh, the symptoms worse. Uh, by and large, the gold standard is systemic steroids. Uh, oral prednisone is, typically is, is what you're going to see people using. If you're worried about uh, time or or compliance with the medications, then an intramuscular dose of triamcinolone uh, is, is fairly adequate as well. Uh, both with the triamcinolone and the prednisone, you do need to talk to patients about just being aware of a resurgence of the symptoms after the, the steroids are weaned off. And so just keep that in mind. And that's, that's typically why the prednisone is extended out to 14 days. Um, you will see some people talk about, oh, can't we just do some desensitization and, and try to like, you know, do micro exposures and hopefully we can uh, make this not affect us uh, like, you know, when we were kids. And people have even tried eating it. Uh, I don't know why you would ever do that, but all of your mucocutaneous tissues will be poorly affected. And the uh, pruritus ani, which is actually a documented uh, problem from this desensitization technique, uh, doesn't look like a lot of fun. So I uh, wouldn't uh, advise that. Um, other things for prevention that you should uh, consider uh, gloving, like if you're if you're doing work in the in the field, if you're doing like a trail crew to help with trail maintenance or something, uh, latex gloves are, are hypo bueno. The, the urashile can go right through the latex, uh, so you should be aware of that. But vinyl and nitrile gloves uh, seem to work fine. Uh, when I say breathable, loosely woven uh, clothing, mostly I just mean dry clothing. Uh, it's when the clothing gets wet, like that poor firefighter we saw earlier, that uh, the, the ear shile will wick its way down to the skin. Uh, so you want to be, maybe even consider carrying an extra pair of clothing so you can stay dry uh, when you're in uh, poison ivy, poison oak country. 
Um, now, this is very interesting, and this is actually has made its way down to the military literature as well. Uh, barrier creams and lotions show a lot of promise. There's a whole host of products out there, uh, you know, uh, things to rub on you before you go out into the back country where you're going to have this exposure. And those have shown uh, a fair amount of success in limiting the contact dermatitis uh, coming about after your exposure. I mentioned desensitization is not so effective. People have talked about uh, immunotherapy uh, as a uh, preventative uh, measure. And obviously there's an increased cost, uh, excuse me, cost as, and uh, risk benefit issues that have to be considered there. Um, I don't know if, uh, how you feel about vaccinations, but um, there is some discussions also about uh, vaccine therapy for uh, leading to some sort of desensitization uh, in people's reaction to your child. Um, so lots of things on, on on the future landscape as to how we might uh, mitigate the effect of your style uh, in humans. But for now, barrier creams, lotions, and, and the things we mentioned above are probably the most practical answers. So moving on, uh, other troublemakers that are notable, uh, stinging nettle. Uh, I, I see there's a couple of Portland Mountain Rescue people here uh, on the talk, and we are famous for uh, bushwhacking through stinging nettle and, and blackberries. Uh, in search of some poor lost soul, and uh, man, that is a booger uh, to deal with. It's it's not like your your shile to uh, toxicodendron plants that have like weeks and weeks of uh, symptoms and and these weeping vesicles and stuff like that. But uh, for the for the few days, a stinging nettle uh, is is affecting you. It's it's very uncomfortable. Uh, now the plant itself has uh, sort of a mixed reputation because it, it is known as having all these phytonutrients and being very vitamin rich. Uh, people, you see people like making teas out of it, eating it like it's a, a you know a piece of romaine lettuce or something. But uh, when you're walking through it, uh, it can be uh, pretty painful. As uh, these little things you see on the right hand side are called trichomes. They're like the little hypodermic needle hairs that are present in, present in five of the six subspecies of the stinging nettle. And, and when your skin comes in contact with these little microscopic needles, you get this local response that's mediated in histamine and serotonin and acetylcholine and, and leads to similar symptoms and, and redness and, and swelling uh, in the skin. But uh, interestingly, because of some of the uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, the stinging nettle has on your, your tissue, after the sting, uh, there there becomes this like tingling sensation uh, and paresthesias, and and there's actually and, and the people who talk about the therapeutic benefits of this and treating arthritis and all, uh, other kinds of ailments, uh, th that paresthesias could actually be a positive benefit uh, in some of the discussion points of, of why why you should take a bath and stinging nettle every night. Um, by and large, if you did nothing, uh, this typically will resolve with soap and water over the next two to three days. Uh, there is some uh, discussion about antihistamine creams and low-dose topical steroids being effective, but you need to be uh, cognizant of, of the systemic absorption of, of those steroids, obviously, and over-the-counter NSAIDs like ibuprofen can be helpful as well. Uh, unlike your, your shial, there's no resin that's left uh, on your clothing, uh, but so just full cover coverage clothing and avoiding bare skin contact with the stinging nettle is basically your key element for pre prevention. So that's your your don't rub it on me talk. Uh, now I, I do want to talk about a couple other toxins and plants that uh, are are super interesting and very relevant to the Pacific Northwest, and that's shrooms, mushrooms. They're, they're super popular around here. Uh, for, for those of us in the rescue business, we do at least one or two rescues a year for either hunters or mushroom hunters, and uh, it, it's a particularly uh, relevant for, for those people. Now, often, what are they doing? They're looking down at the ground and they're trying to find out, you know, where the mushrooms are. They're not having a lot of situational awareness or uh, directional sort of awareness of where they've come and where they're going. So much so that they've actually backed themselves off the cliff, cliff's edge before. I've seen that before in the Malala area. Um, so what we're not going to talk about uh, right now are the, the meadow mushrooms and the chanterelles and the morels, these sort of coveted delicacies of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they're really cool looking, and I've, I've tried them at the at the benefit of some of my friends. Uh, but the the ones that we want to really talk about are the, the Amanita variety, the death cap mushrooms. And, and here you can see sort of the uh, timeline of growth uh, of uh, this is actually like seven different mushrooms, but it's sort of laid out as if it was growing. And what I want to point out first, and just like we have uh, the mushrooms appearing, or the uh, excuse me, the poison ivy and poison oak having different appearances throughout the season, mushrooms can do the same thing. 
So uh, typically when you look at the death cap mushrooms, the Amanita phylloides, you'll see the, the white stalk, uh, the mature variety will have that white ring that's right underneath the mushroom cap. The gills of the uh, mushroom will be uh, white as well. They'll be white gilled mushrooms. And they tend to have a tanned, sometimes speculated ap appearance to the mushroom cap. Uh, but not to be confused with like Super Mario Brothers, the Amanita muscaria, which you see there on the left side, uh, very, very popular. You see it in, in you know, pictures and, and storybooks of, of mushrooms. Now, this is also an Amanita mushroom. It also will make you sick uh, if you if eaten raw. There are in India and Turkey and a couple other uh, European countries, people covet the, the muscaria uh, variety and they will actually uh, boil it down or cook it up and, and use it in certain certain ways in their diet. Um, it is known to have some hallucinogenic properties to it, so you need to be mindful of that. It's not the psilocybin uh, type mushroom, which is another lecture, but uh, it, it people do have some alternative uses for the Amanita muscaria, but it typically won't kill you. Uh, now, uh, the Amanita uh, phylloides, however, is, is a bad player and will it, it, it earned its name death cat mushroom for a reason. What I want to point out, though, as we look at this picture here and you see the muscaria on the left, uh, the phylloides is on the right. And and actually, this picture here is a, a screenshot from a patient of mine I saw on the ER about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he was from Ukraine, and apparently uh, muscaria is a, is a delicacy over there and a highly sought after mushroom. And so he was foraging from mushrooms here in the Pacific Northwest when he encountered something that looked like muscaria to him. But it, what it was was just a late season, speculated, uh, beat up, uh, you know, sort of late summer uh, phylloides variety, and he was super sick. So I just want to point out that if you're doing this yourself or you're talking to your patients about foraging for mushrooms, it's really good for them to take a class, have some books, go out with somebody who has really local knowledge about how to avoid the bad players, because there are a lot of things that look alike and can be uh, really bad for you. So uh, like your anticholinergic uh, crisis, you, you'll see people with this presentation of sludge syndrome after they have amanita toxicity. And the, the workup for that is gonna, you're gonna be checking the blood sugar. We'll talk about that in a second. Your metabolic panel, your liver functions. And as their liver begins to shut down, uh, you wanna be really cognizant to sh check the coags and the DIC labs. Um, also, you want to make sure that this isn't something else. Your differential uh, is still pretty expanded. You'll be doing urine drug screens and tox screens and things like that uh, as you're working this patient up. But uh, amanita toxicity by and large has three stages. Uh, the first one, and, and this is how I saw this guy initially at triage, was just profound uh, abdominal pain, cramping, lots of diarrhea, lots of nausea and some emesis, and, and pretty miserable. Um, and so is this a gastroenteritis? You know, you know, get a history from the patient. You know, if they shows you the screenshot, you've got your answer. But um, oftentimes, you know, the things that you see commonly in the ER, you have to have these things uh, in your in your background uh, knowledge, like, oh, this, this could be Amanita. This, I have to say, was not the first thing that uh, was in my differential diagnosis uh, when I saw this patient. And it actually was, although I felt really bad for him, it was profoundly interesting to actually see something uh, more unique in the ED setting. Now, unfortunately, uh, he did not have a great outcome as he worked through the disease. And what happens typically in these three stages is they have the profound GI effects, and then they get better uh, about a day or two after the uh, initial ingestion. And we call this the convalescent phase or the honeymoon period. And the, the abdominal pain is really subsiding. There's, there's less nausea and diarrhea. But if you look at their labs, they're... they're liver function tests are just getting worse and worse, and they're beginning to develop hepatorenal failure and uh, some uh, electrolyte abnormalities and encephalopathy and, and um, coagulopathy. And, and that begins to be more clinically relevant a, a few days later, two to four days after the ingestion. So uh, what do you do if you encounter somebody like this? Well, uh, activated charcoal is, is super helpful. We want to get as much out of the system as you can. Uh, and so that we winded up doing that for this gentleman, uh, penicillin, uh, as well as uh, silbonin. This is the first time I've ever used a milk thistle derivative in the emergency department. Uh, and it was not because I came up with it myself. I had to have, get some help from our local toxicologist and uh, mucamist or acetylcysteine. Uh, all have been shown to uh, show a mortality benefit. There is some uh, extracorporeal uh, albumin dialysis. And by the, by the time that discussion was happening, I was uh, no longer caring for this patient, but uh, that's that's sort of a uh, on the fringe uh, uh, therapeutic uh, plan that, that can be discussed. Uh, all comers who have this amanita toxicity has a profoundly high mortality of around 27%. Um, 
Uh, obviously, a better score if they get to the hospital and they can begin treatment uh, with the things that I mentioned above. Uh, but you're going to be following these people closely as their liver uh, begins to fail. You'll be uh, looking for hypoglycemia. And uh, that's actually one of the things that leads to the mortality uh, pretty quickly. So monitor them for that. And that's amanitas, uh, bad, bad stuff. Now, uh, other things in the uh, poisons and toxins uh, this, that would be relevant for the discussion is another Pacific Northwest uh, plant. And uh, I, again, I can't see you, I'm looking at my slides, but if somebody could, you know, in the chat or raise your hand and say something uh, with your with your microphone, uh, which one of these two plants is, is a poison uh, for your kids and pets? And I, I guess you too, if you were to eat it or something. This would be the part where we all engage together. The right side. The one on the left. The one on the right. One on the right. What is? Who is that? Who's speaking there? My name's Kellen. Hi, Kellen. Nice, nice to virtually meet you. Uh, what is that <laughs> plant on the right? Do you know what that is? Uh, is that nightlock? I don't know. Yeah, it is the a deadly nightshade. It's a a tropa belladonna. That's right. Um, so. Uh, that is that is correct, but actually both of them are toxic for you. So it's kind of a trick question. I feel bad about that, but not too bad. Um, the one on the left is is profoundly more common uh, because we we use it, uh, it. It grows native, but we also use it in uh, the metropolitan area as a shrub. I and mean, when people use this as a a border shrub, in the same way that they would use like arbor arborvitae uh, or arborvitae uh, plants to separate their land from their neighbor and that sort of thing. It's commonly known as a skip laurel, uh, more technical word was ship laurel, uh, also in the in cherry laurel, uh, people will call it in the East Coast, but it's known for cyanide uh, toxicity. And uh, it's particularly uh, uh, attractive to pets and kids because number one, uh, like the atrophic belladonna, uh, the, the little balls, you know, these kids, they just like to stick things in their mouth. You know, they, oh, it's cute. I'll put it in my ear, I'll put it in my mouth. And, um, both of these can lead to toxicity. And so, you know, I have these in my yard and my dogs have learned to not eat them. I think they got sick one time. Uh, that, that was the end of that. But it has a cyanide toxicity. Uh, cattle are also uh, famous for getting sick from these if it's growing on their land. And so uh, need to be careful for that. Uh, what, what do you do when you have a known ingestion for, for these type of uh, plants? Well, for the Atropa belladonna, it's the same uh, antidote that you'd use for, for atropine as the physostigmine, plus or minus benzodiazepines and some other supportive measures. Uh, for the uh, for the skip laurel, uh, you, you can get it out of their system. They're already going to have some GI disturbances and uh, nausea, and they may be already be vomiting on their own. Uh, but it could also lead to GI obstruction later on. And so you want to try to get it out of the system as you can. And, and so activated charcoal and then checking for electrolyte abnormalities and, and hydration are important for those patients. Gosh, there is um, so much to say about the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we have all these things that don't kill you. I mean, I don't want to lead the topic as if uh, everything out there wants to kill you. We have a, a beautiful area, lots of things to eat uh, and uh, make use of. And you could take all kinds of uh, naturalist uh, classes and, and hiking classes that will show you, you know, what you can survive on and how you can eat it, and what vitamin is in it, um, salmonberry, huckleberry, bear grass, and a whole host of others. Um, would make for uh, good bites, but we're going to talk about some other bites, uh, bites that have uh, poisons in them as well, bacteria mostly. And so let's let's move on to that. Uh, this is the don't get bit part of the talk for the evening. Uh, Oregon is is uh, well populated with with both bears and cougar, and the statistics are actually relatively startling if you consider the the rest of the United States. There are about thirty thousand cougar in the lower forty eight United States. Uh, 6,000 of those live in Oregon. That's one fifth of the total U.S. population. They're living in Oregon. That's that's pretty profound. Uh, in the bear category, there's about 300,000 bear, and we only have one tenth of them in Oregon. So Oregon is is very friendly to wild animals. And um, I also want to point out that uh, when it comes to the the bear population, I'm only speaking about black bear uh, because that is typically uh, what we have in Oregon. We're not really a grizzly bear state. However, you should know that, um, especially for those of you who live in Washington, that Washington is repopulating as grizzly bear population. Uh, they, they were a native species at one point, and so they are being uh, reintroduced in the Northern Cascade area. Uh, just something to be mindful of, that it's not a black bear only state. And we're only separated by a river. So if you see any of those grizzlies coming across the 205, you, you let me know. 
So, uh, so just some generic uh, components of uh, wild animal bites. Um, we know a little bit about statistics, but a lot of it is, is not fully known if, from one animal to the other. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you what I can, what I can about uh, these type of bites. Uh, the severity really depends on which animal it is and, and what was the reason for attack. Was this a, an attack of defense? Were you seen as a source of food? Uh, were you being aggressive or were, was it an issue coming into uh, cubs? Um, and, and also what was the size of the human who was being attacked? Was it a small animal, uh, a small animal, small human, like a, a toddler or a school-aged child or small, uh, you know, adult even, uh, or was it a, a larger animal, a, a larger human who can fight themselves off a little bit? So, um, you know, size matters in this case. And uh, most, most of these animals are not gonna attack unless they're provoked uh, or they've otherwise been conditioned that you uh, would be a food source for them. Um, unfortunately, most of these attacks happen a long way from definitive care. So these are, you know, we have all kinds of problems in Portland as far as uh, attacks downtown and stuff like that, but there's no bears and cougars there. And, and so uh, when bears and cougars are attacking, it's typically pretty far away from definitive care. And, and that's where some of your morbidity mortality uh, is increased because it's wilderness medicine. You know, it's, it's more remote. So the initial wound treatment would be very similar to a domestic animal attack. Both these animals that we're talking about have fairly large teeth. And so they're a little bit different than your typical domestic uh, cat bite where you uh, have a heightened uh, concern for uh, pasturella, for example. Uh, I mean, you would use like augmentin or amoxicillin uh, to treat those bites, but you still need to irrigate and clean these wounds. You, you do need to consider antibiotics uh, generally the same as you would for any domestic animal bite. Um, when it comes to large bears or even cougars, uh, for example, you need to uh, be concerned about being the humans being thrown uh, or being crushed under the animal. Uh, uh, the uh, cougars in particular, they like to crush necks uh, when, as they pounce. Uh, so you need to even be thinking about C-spine injuries. And I, I may have talk, mentioned this later as well. Uh, and obviously looking for penetrating trauma and, and uh, injury to the tissue that's below there. What type of bears do we have? I mentioned that we predominantly have black bears in Oregon, but we still have the Ursus arctus or the grizzly brown bear uh, in Washington now, and certainly more of those in Alaska. Polar bear, uh, not really a risk for us here. Um, bears are, are remarkably fast, and you, you will not outrun a bear, and you probably won't get out of a bear's way if you're trying to climb a tree or something like that. They can run uh, 40 to even 50 miles an hour in some reports. And uh, they do attack more often in the summer because obviously they hibernate in the winter. Uh, and they are, often that attack comes sudden. So uh, either you've startled them or they've startled you. And, and then all of a sudden you have a bear attack and it's a, sort of an unexpected close encounter that leads to uh, that, that uh, interaction. So how, how do we prevent bear attacks? Uh, making noise, bear bells, walking groups, talking loud. You know, I have two teenagers and sometimes I would just like to have a quiet walk in the woods, but they, uh, kids make noise. And, and it's, it's a great thing when you're trying to keep bears away from you is to uh, be loud and be known uh, that the bear, if they hear you, they are going to, in general, want to go away from you. Uh, avoid common areas for bears where you, you might think they like, obviously don't walk into a bear den, uh, don't get near, uh, you know, bear cubs and things like that. You want to avoid um, being anywhere in the vicinity of cubs uh, because mom will be nearby. Uh, the pepper spray may be useful as a consideration. And, and people also talk about firearms. I'm not gonna have a firearms lecture uh, tonight, but I do want to point out that, you know, typically your bear spray can shoot about 30 to 40 feet and it sits in a holster on your belt. And uh, with the fact that a lot of these encounters are uh, fairly sudden and unexpected, uh, the, the bears can move very quick. And so, uh, you know, 40 miles an hour and the bear's ability to get to you uh, can happen really quickly. And, and with only a 30 foot range on these bear sprays, you have to be pretty, you know, Johnny on the quick with your, your text, you know, Texas Western gunslinger uh, with a bear spray in order to get that out, get it deployed, get it in the bear's face before they cover that 30 feet and get to you. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, you also have to avoid getting the, the pepper spray in your eyes because then now are you not only bear uh, dinner, but you also can't see. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind as, as you're you know, putting confidence in things like pepper spray or bear spray. Um, also, uh, you know, don't get it on your skin and clothes. It has a pretty bad uh, reaction and rash and stuff like that. 
So uh, never feed a bear, keep the, the food away from the, the campsite. And, and there is this thing called the 100 meter rule. Uh, it's like a triangle. You have your, your camp 100 meters from your food and your food 100 meters from where you're cooking. And, and you keep those, those areas separated. Uh, I know a lot of people don't do that because you know, they go in the back country and here's the shelter. And how far are they really going to go away from the shelter to hang their food up in a tree? Uh, 10 feet is the minimum. Bears can reach really high up into the trees. And so uh, 10 feet is, is the bare minimum to hang the, the food from the tree. Obviously, don't store food in your tent. And that's not just true for bears, but all, there's lots of varmints who want to get into your tent at night if you keep your food there. And we mentioned staying away from the bear cubs. That's uh, That's bad. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, the movie The Great Outdoors with uh, John Candy, uh, but there was a lot of lessons to be learned about bears there. Don't look that bear in the eyes. Um, I, I can't attest to the uh, the successfulness uh, of not looking the bear in the eyes. I've never had that opportunity to try or not try uh, that technique. But uh, in the literature, if you if you read about you know bear prevention and uh, in avoiding injury from bear encounters that is one of the things that they they say not to do it's seen as an aggressive act um very slow movements are are sanctioned here or excuse me in order here you don't want to be making any sudden jerky moves as that may provoke the bear um and and this is specifically talking about brown bears um you do want to stand your ground you want to face the bear and you may find yourself slowly walking away, but uh, you definitely don't want to approach or, or move quickly uh, as that may provoke the bear to uh, come towards you. A lot of times they're acting in an aggressive uh, fashion. They want to show you who's boss and they may actually lose interest uh, shortly into the attack. Uh, they're not seeing you as a food source, but just want to let you know that they are the boss, which indeed they are. Now, brown bears versus black bears, there's a lot of discussion. Oh, brown bears are, are you know, larger and, and black bears are more cute and cuddly. And well, black bears can be quite large and they're, they're generally not cute and cuddly. They do have some different behavioral characteristics. But the other element of it is that brown and black uh, are those those colors are, are very uh, vague. You know, there are black bears that are actually more of a cinnamon color um, or uh, more of a brown color. Uh, color and, and there are brown bears who can look quite dark and and then um of course you know throughout the year their their coats may, may change a little bit as sun exposure and dirt sand and things like that so it, it can be a little confusing but some of the things that are uh, very uh unique to brown bears is they have a little bit more of a spoon shape uh to their their forehead uh and they also have a, a large hump over their their shoulders uh if you're looking at them from the side view uh, so that will that will sort of alert you to the, the brown bear, and generally they they tend to be larger. So black bears, um, un unlike you know not wanting to provoke the brown bear, you do want to be loud, uh, make make yourself look big, and and slowly back away. Um, I have some great videos when I was in I think it was Yosemite. Uh, I got this this guy in camp, and he was just you know bad bear, bad bear, <clears throat> yelling, throwing things at the bear as he's trying to back himself away from the bear. Uh, and, and in general, if, if, if a black bear does encounter you, you do want to kick and fight aggressively. And they typically will see that you are not worth the fight and will uh, go on to uh, leave you alone. But there are definitely that, th those numbers there, plus or minus 60 deaths from black bear encounters, that number has actually grown closer to 70, 75. Uh, that's, that's old data there. So uh, other things that bite you, we talked about bears and I, I mentioned cougars. Well, uh, what are cougars? Well, they're also mountain lions, uh, pumas, uh, panthers, and catamount, which is Appalachian for cat of the mountain, uh, if you speak Appalachian. And so I, I, I bring that up because almost every time I talk about cougars, I always get this question, well, what about, what about you know, pumas or mountain lions. And, and these, these are all one and the same type variety. Uh, and then people will typically ask, well, what about the, the black panther? And the black panther is actually not a thing. Uh, it's either a member of the jaguar or the panther species, but it just has increased melanism. Uh, so they appear black, but it's not actually a separate animal. And so they, they belong to one of those other two uh, groups, but they do look cool, um, but not a different animal. So a little bit more about cougars. Uh, we have roughly 74 known attacks in the, the lower 48 United States. 15% of those are, are fatal. That's a, a really high number for, for puma and mountain lion cougar attacks. The, the thing about them is they often will see you before you ever see them. Um, and, and so that's obviously a concern. Uh, some of the things that we thought about 
cougars and their typical behavior. Uh, for whatever reason, we're in, in the recent uh, years, we've been seeing some some variations of what we thought was typical uh, cougar behavior. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, most of the people who were attacked by cougar, uh, or roughly 50% of them, were less than 18 years old. They tended to be smaller humans. Uh, and the common site of injury is going to be your head and neck, as, as well as the, the chest. Um, as far as like dining on humans, uh, they tend to eat uh, from the inside out. So they will uh, eviscerate the abdomen and eat up into the chest, uh, but often leave the rest of the musculoskeletal system alone. Uh, and often an another animal will come behind them, like a bear, for example, and and finish off uh, eating what was left behind from the cougar. Um, they, uh, they don't typically eat uh, everything. Uh, it, I will say that cougar attacks, I mentioned that they're becoming more... more uh, frequent uh, and, and certainly of a large population of them in Oregon. Uh, this uh, gal, Diana Bober, was a uh, a rescue that we were called on for by Portland Mountain Rescue back in 2018. Um, we were called after she went missing and and then uh, there was a body recovery and it appeared that she had been attacked by a cougar. Um, the Forest Service and the sheriffs got together and put a, a bunch of trail cameras out trying to find you know which cougar did this. And one thing that was fairly startling during that time, I don't know if you saw this in the news or not, but uh, there was a whole load of cougars out there. And then it was hard, uh, difficult to determine, well, which one did it? Who was the assailant? You know, they can't fingerprint these guys. And so um, they did eventually take down the cougar that they thought was responsible based on some of the, the location of the, the cougar to the trail cams and the site of where Ms. Bober was found. Um, and, but uh, as far as like DNA matching Ms. Bober to this particular cougar, uh, they it was so far after the fact that they finally caught this cougar that they, they couldn't do the DNA matching. And uh, it, it may be that her assailant is, is, is still out there. But uh, there's a lot of cougars uh, in the Mount Hood National Forest. A couple other uh, recent stories, as recent as of June of this year, uh, if, if you're a mountain biker and you know uh, the area, this we have great mountain biking here. Um, Sandy River Trail System, that one of the trails called the Lower Hide and Seek. Uh, we had a cougar who was uh, running in parallel to the trail, uh, keeping pace with the mountain biker as they made their way down. And uh, that's uh, that's pretty interesting behavior. These these are not typical cougar behaviors who want to be left alone. Uh, for them to be, uh, you know, coming after the humans pacing the mountain bikes, uh, you know, that's that's not normal, what we thought to be normal cougar behavior. And when we talked about prevention, we'll talk about uh, some of the things to be considered there. Uh, the other story there on the right is also at Mount Hood. This gentleman uh, was approached by two cougars. Uh, he shot one of them and uh, the other one uh, ran off. But uh, again, that's an atypical behavior for cougars. That They're not like wolves where they typically attack in packs. And so uh, that was another atypical behavior that just kind of begs the question of, of what do we really know about these animals? Um, so here's an elk hunter who's about, to, I'm not sure if the, the, the dead elk is about to be dinner or, or the, the hunter himself, but uh, you don't want to be that guy. And, and like I mentioned, they often see you before you see them. Uh, so be, be aware that they're there. They're very quiet and stealthy. And they often will uh, catch you in your flank uh, when you're not uh, aware of them. So uh, during a cougar attack, how do we manage this? Well, scene safety, I, I we put that out there. Is like, is the scene safe? Well, uh, just to confront that that word, because we often use that in wilderness medicine, is the scene safe, scene safe? Uh, let's just acknowledge that the scene is not safe. Um, you know, if, you, if it was safe, you wouldn't left, leave your house. Uh, but safety is third. And so what that means is that we're acknowledging that we're we're in the wild, we're in the backcountry, and there is an element of of not being safe in everything that we do. Uh, but we want to just have a, a awareness of what are our risks for safety and do what we can to mitigate them. So like making noise to make yourself known. Uh, that is that is acknowledging that this is not a safe environment, and we're trying to make it safer by doing things that mitigate that risk. Uh, so after you've done that, um, you want to follow MARCH, which is, a, if you haven't learned that term, it's another acronym for uh, massive hemorrhage, airway respiration, circulation, and then the H's. The H's can be hypothermia, hyperthermia, hunker down, or hike out. And uh, the reason why they put uh, massive hemorrhage at the, at the front of that, as opposed to like front country medicine where we do the ABCs, is that uh, blood is something that's really hard to uh, uh, 
uh, replace in the backcountry. And so uh, that being the case, if, if there's somebody who's bleeding rapidly, uh, we want to go ahead and, and replace, or excuse me, uh, stop that blood from uh, being lost. And that maybe require either just direct pressure on a wound or a tourniquet, and then moving on uh, to uh, the airway and other things. Uh, that that tourniquet or the, the pressure on the wound is a very quick maneuver that allows us to focus on the other problems at hand. Uh, like I mentioned uh, with domestic animals, we want to remove debris, irrigate debris, look for foreign objects. You can see in the, the uh, plane films at the left hand there, uh, the, the tooth that's lodged in the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint that had to be retrieved. Uh, you do want to look for fractures. And, and then just like with bears, these people are going to need to be evacuated for definitive care. And be be mindful, just because cougars are you know about the same weight as a, as a human, you still need to be worried about uh, fractures and, and um, blunt trauma and things like that as well. So I mentioned they're becoming more common. They stalk, they pounce, they like to go after the cervical spine. Uh, they may be scared off by aggressive behavior. And if by, uh, by that, if you want to see some really cool cougar videos, I have a lot that I can share with you. Email me after this. Uh, my email is my last name at gmail.com. So bisinger at gmail.com. I'm happy to uh, share some, some great videos uh, on, on cougar encounters. Um, if you or your patients uh, are being educated by you, your family being educated by you, uh, Cougars are something you do want to uh, be big, be aggressive, be loud, uh, fight back with any object you have available. And uh, like that mountain biker who's being chased, you don't want to run. They will uh, chase you. Uh, it's, it's instinctive for them to chase a game. And so you want to uh, avoid that behavior. Uh, okay, so uh, things that bite. And, and, and poisons and toxins. Uh, the, the topic uh, in our lecture tonight would not be complete with other mythical creatures of the Pacific Northwest. So uh, with that, we'll just give a little bit of a uh, thumbs up to Bigfoot, also known as Sasquatch. Uh, original citation for Sasquatch was in our own Oregonian back in June 16th, 1924. Uh, reportedly, he can grow between 10 to 15 feet. He is an omnivore. Uh, and is quite vocal. He has a lot of, a lot of noises that people have reported hearing that oh, it's Bigfoot and, and, and to howl, to scream, they, they could even whistle. And so I, uh, you know, beware of what you hear in the woods. It may indeed be Sasquatch. Uh, there is a uh, Bigfoot trap. We've been looking for him for a while, trying to get some closer encounters. And uh, there is a trap in uh, the Siskiyou National Forest. It's more of a tourist trap now than anything. Uh, but so far, Bigfoot has been able to thwart man's efforts to get to know him better. Also, uh, other mythical creatures of the Pacific Northwest are ligers. Uh, bred for their skills and magic. It's a cross between a tiger, tiger and a lion, and they are indeed native to the Pacific Northwest and pretty much my favorite animal. You want to be uh, not bit by them because they can take your breath away. All right, so ligers are, are not the only thing that take, can take your breath away. And there's a beautiful picture of Mount Hood, but it's it's not the uh, sheer beauty uh, of the mountain that we're gonna be talking about next, but rather it's deadly belching, uh, burping of the mountain. I, I, I know that a lot of you didn't think that mountains burp, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So Mount Hood, also known as Y East, is uh, 11,249 feet tall. For you metric people, that's about 3,429 meters. Uh, it's uh, like the national forest that's around it. It is uh, a metropolitan uh, wonderland. It's very close to 1 million people. And so it's heavily recreated, recreated and about 50 miles from the city. There are 12 glaciers, what's left of them, uh, on the mountain. And roughly 10,000 people try to climb it every year. Uh, the statistics of deaths is a little bit fuzzy, but roughly 150 people have been, in, or excuse me, uh, died on the mountain. But there are about 50 rescues every year in the mountain beach that are covered either by Portland Mountain Rescue or the Hood River Crag Rats. Uh, I told you we were talking about, you know, don't rub it on me, don't don't bite, and now don't breathe. Uh, talking about the burping of Mount Hood, and that don't breathe comes from the the Mount Hood fumaroles. And so uh, now we'll direct our attention to the the south side of the mountain, which is the side you would approach coming up from Timberline Lodge. Uh, that is also where you would encounter have uh, some common encounters with the fumaroles of Mount Hood. There's some in the Devil's Kitchen area and some over in the Hot Rocks area, if you know your mountain geography. And these are not crevasses. They, they, I guess they could have the appearance of a crevasse or an opening in the snow, but let's look at the definition of what is a fumarole. A fumarole is, is an opening in the planet's crust, generically speaking, uh, it, usually around volcanoes where there is an emission of steam and gas. And it's that steam and gas that is uh, of concern. 
Uh, in the case of Mount Hood, the, the heat from the fumaroles begins to melt the snow over them. As you can see in this picture here, it, it leads to a hole in the mountain. And uh, after that happens, you have this, this open pit or shaft that goes deep into the, to the mountain, depending on how, how tall the snow is above it. So in the case of climbers and those 10,000 people that come up to Mount Hood every year, uh, you have the, the risks of snow and rock and ice fall. And, and obviously people can get hypothermic. Yes, there's altitude if they're there long enough that can certainly affect them. Uh, fumaroles are, can be tight little spaces. And so you have the, the risk of confined space hazards uh, and all the musculoskeletal injuries that can happen when you, when you fall into them. But once you're down inside the mountain, the mountain is literally trying to kill you. Um, there are gases there that are, uh, hypo bueno, uh, as we would say, there, there's hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide. But which one is it? Uh, which gas is, is the, the agent for us to be con concerned with? Well, uh, we'll talk about uh, how that's, how Mount Hood is unique uh, in compa comparison to the uh, other Cascade volcanoes. But here's just some pictures uh, from Portland Mountain Rescue and some of the rescues that we've done on Mount Hood. Uh, avoid, excuse me, ignore the uh, yellow snow that you see in the left picture. I've uh, should have edited that out, but um, you can see the rescuers uh, trying to pull uh, a patient and the, the rescuer out of the fumarole. I'm actually on the end of the rope in that picture and the middle picture uh, there is the same from the same date uh, where we had a 59 year old gentleman fall from the summit into the fumarole. And this is looking down on the, the picture on the right there is looking down into the hole before going in after him. Uh, so down in the hole, what happens? Well, there's gases there. We mentioned the carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide. And if you look at the uh, graph uh, image there on the right, you can see that the the different volcanoes in the Cascade Range have a different level of, of uh, gases that can be uh, more of a risk to human sustainability. So like Mount Rainier, we're really worried about CO2, whereas St. Helens and Hood, we're, we're more concerned about hydrogen sulfide. So uh, this is where we could have a nice long lecture on the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. It certainly is relevant for this discussion, but we're gonna move right past that. Um, what is hydrogen sulfide? If you've ever been up on the mountain, uh, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide both can have this very rotten egg, pungent smell. It can be flammable. Uh, and unfortunately for your, your soft materials like climbing rope per se, or your nice Gore-Tex jacket, uh, it can corrode materials and degrade them to where they're not uh, trustworthy anymore. Um, with left with you know long-term exposure, exposure that exceeds what OSHA says you can uh, tolerate, what they call the... Uh, uh, immediate death, uh, the IDLH levels, um, you, you can develop, you know, uh, you know, lactic acidosis and things that can affect your cardiac and nervous system. Initially, you're going to have uh, mucosal irritation uh, and, and then uh, headache and, and uh, cognitive impairment. Um, if it, if it's uh, more of a CO2 problem, we, we have very quickly some respiratory arrest as you move into these pools of the heavy gas and, and uh, literally they can go out like a light uh, because the CO2 could be so concentrated. Um, yes, uh, the cardiac systems, you can get some like QT prolongation uh, happening and stuff like that. But most of the time, you, you you know, when we're doing these types of rescues, we're not there long enough to have that happen. We're more worried about respiratory arrest and, and bronchoconstriction and uh, our, our vision becoming so impaired that we can't see what we're doing. Um, so uh, that's, that's uh, something that we, we're sort of primarily focused on. Um, when it comes to rescues in the Mount Hood fumaroles, uh, you know, I mentioned March and dealing with massive hemorrhage and all these other elements of, of wilderness medicine care. When it comes to the fumaroles, because it's such a high risk environment, really all of that is going to be delayed till later, till, till outside of the fumarole. So, um, you know, high, uh, oxygen would be great if we had it, but we don't, we're not going to take the time to carry heavy oxygen down into the fumarole. In fact, the airway and breathing, there, there are some adjuncts that we might add if we're in the hole, but uh, the, the goal there is to get out as quickly as possible. Once they're out, um, you, you are going to focus on those ABCs. We'll remove any sort of contaminated clothing and, and replace it. If they've had long-term exposure on their soft tissue, we'll irrigate that soft tissue and try to get uh, the aqueous form of, of the gas uh, off of that. Re remember that when you're in the fumarole, uh, literally the rock walls and the snow walls are are spitting steam, uh, and that steam has hydrogen sulfide uh, and water and other things in it that are getting all over you. And so uh, we have some protective measures that we do when we're in the hole 
uh, but that's uh, obviously a, a risk for being down there. Um, it's like a crevasse; it can be quite cold, and and so people get you know hypothermic, and you have to be treat that just like as you would any other snowy alpine environment. And if they're having any sort of airway symptoms, you know your albuterols and racemic epinephrines and things like that are going to be important as bronchodilator measures. So uh, prior to going in uh, for rescues, we, we bring with us air purifying respirators with uh, organic gas uh, scrubbers on them. Uh, the cartridges that go on these masks uh, can be uh, designed for different types of gases. We use one for organic gases, uh, one for us, one for the patient, and even a third one if we're going to bring two people in the hole uh, to get the rescue done. Other things uh, that we do before we go in and and also, while we're in, uh, is uh, gas monitors. You can see uh, myself here with a couple other rescue leaders uh, measuring the gas concentration of the fumarole. We can see the steam coming out of the fumarole there. Uh, during the rescue, there will be somebody standing at the edge, uh, like in this case me, uh, with a hose coming off the, the gas monitor. Uh, that's an aspirating monitor. Those monitors will aspirate about one foot per second through the tubing as they suck the gas and take a measurement of it. So if you have a 30 foot tubing, that's that's 30 seconds before you're getting the most accurate information about the gas concentration. So um, that's just something to think about uh, when you have a, a rescuer in the hole, which is why we have two gas monitors. The other gas monitor is going to be mounted uh, on that rescuer's harness, but dangling well below their airway so that if they're beginning to go lower into a heavy gas pool where maybe some hydrogen and sulfide or carbon dioxide is, has settled, uh, that the gas monitor will go off and alert them uh, that they're about to uh, exceed what is acceptable, even for the air purifying respirators to function correctly. And uh, we have a, a new system now where our two gas monitors talk to each other. So the guy at the surface and, and the rescuer in the hole, uh, th those gas monitors will alert at the same time if they exceed uh, the IDLH uh, uh, standards that we've set forth on our team. So that's uh, by and large how the, the funerals work and the gas is there. Um, the, the, the mainstay of our of our sort of efforts in, in getting people out of there is get them out quickly. Um, the definitive evaluation and care and full patient assessment happens after you get them out of the hole. Uh, we may rig directly to their to their harness or bring a harness for them. Uh, the orange apparatus you see there is a giant piece of plastic. It's called a SCEDCO. Uh, it's one of the few FAA uh, certified uh, extraction tools that can also go into confined spaces. It's fairly fast and light uh, and efficient. Um, we've also gone to the fumarole without that and just directly clipped into the patient as well. Uh, while you're in the hole, really, because uh, it being such a hazardous environment, you want to be thinking of this like a house fire. Uh, and, and obviously, you're not going to like stay in a house fire to like shave or do your makeup. You're going to get out of there as quickly as you can. And, and similarly, we're not going to be doing like really ex extended patient care. If the patient was unconscious, we might put in an OPA or an NPA to open up their airway and then clip into them and get out of there. We're not going to do rescue breathing. Uh, we're not going to do anything like that. We're going to clip in and get out. Uh, if there's some sort of massive hemorrhage, we can see blood, you know, uh, soaking through their their wool sweater or, or, or creeping out of the Gore-Tex somehow. Uh, we're we're going to throw a tourniquet on, uh, which takes just seconds, and then and then again we're going to get out of there. Even the way the rope system is designed, uh, it's designed that we're backing ourselves in, and it's programmed to bring us back out uh, rather than having to do a bunch of changes up at the at the surface to make that uh, removal from the environment happen. It's it's already uh, rigged for that. So that's the gist of uh, of our talk tonight. Don't get bit. Don't rub it on you. Don't breathe it in. A little taste of mountain rescue and 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 uh, bad things in wilderness medicine. I'm going to stop sharing screen here and see if you have any questions. That was great. Thank you so much. And to our audience members, feel free to un unmute yourself or drop questions down in the chat. We do have one question in the chat from Rowena Christiansen. Um, she's saying, is a severe reaction to your still more common in people who have an underlying predisposition towards eczema, hay fever, asthma? Do topical, uh, do topical corticosteroids help? Also, do you recommend to get your gear squeaky clean before you uh, reuse it in the future to avoid future contamination? So for the gear, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, you know, this the solution to pollution is dilution. So obviously 
washing it, changing the water, washing it again would be really helpful. Uh, when it comes to the metals, you can, you know, like your carabiners and things like that, you can wipe that stuff down and, and vigorously scrub those things. Um, what you want to be careful though is uh, using any sort of special cleaners on on climbing ropes. There are there are certain uh, soaps out there or ways that you can wash climbing ropes in, in a bathtub, and you can uh, put stuff in there uh, to that that's safe for the ropes. But you don't want to just throw them into the uh, wash with a uh, Tide or or all or whatever people are using on their their ropes. Um, I just see that Linda Lukowski Jones is on here. Uh, that's fantastic. I don't know if any of you know her, uh, but Linda, very nice to see you. Um, that's that's great. We haven't we haven't crossed paths in over a decade. But Linda is uh, I would almost say one of my mentors, and is glad glad to see you here. It is wonderful Let's to see you here, so I wouldn't miss it. Huh, thanks for being here. Uh, regarding the hay fever, asthma, uh, eczema, I can't really speak to the uh, predisposition of, of those patients having an increased uh, risk for reaction in, in, in as far as their urochile exposure. It certainly would uh, make sense. It, it is a sort of a cytomediated response, and um, those patients tend to have stronger allergic reactions in general, but I don't have any literature to su support that, only uh, anecdotal common sense. Any other questions? Real quick with the fumaroles, um, when your uh, rescue workers come out of the fumarole, uh, is there any medical evaluation that goes on of them to make sure um, they're not suffering any ill effects? You know, uh, a lot like a lot of things in wilderness medicine, there's a lot of common sense uh, type evaluations. So if I were to say, to Katrina, uh, Katrina, how are you doing this evening? This is where she would respond. She would say, <laughs> I'm, great, I'm great, Pierce, thanks for asking. Um, so in, in, that, in that one sentence there, I've known that she's relatively alert and appropriate, uh, her airway's intact. And so you, you, you start with sort of the basics and the obvious, but if, if somebody is uh, you know, struggling, it, it, there is a tremendous metabolic demand on, on doing mountain rescue and people will get calorically depleted. Uh, they'll you know, be suffering from hypothermia. The, the smell in and around the fumaroles is, is pretty nauseating. And that's true for people in the hole and outside the hole. So you know, we worry about that. Uh, mostly it's checking calories and making sure that they're Okay, in that department, um, I will. I will also say that some of the demands of mountain rescue uh, have a, a stress injury uh, a component to them, and so even though there's a good outcome, uh, what you just put yourself through, uh, what the team went through together, uh, psychological first aid and and doing that component of care is also uh, very important uh, during and after the event. It's a whole other lecture, but um, covering that as well. Anybody else? All right. Hey, hey there, Larry. Nice to see you. Hey, good to see you too. All right, Katrina. Well, thank you very much for the invitation this evening. It was great to spend some time with you guys and um, hope that I can come watch some of your lectures from other great folks in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for joining us. And our next lecture will be November 2nd. So keep an eye on your emails um, to register for it. Have a good night. Thank you so thanks. much. Take care, everybody.